Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to speak here and thank you to Carsten Schöpe to talk about a little bit about the molecular aspects and cellular aspects of uh, long-term support. My talk is a little bit more clinically as a surgeon and we've heard about the data from the Impella 5.0 original design for axillary approach but we also like the axillary approach. It provides full support and we have seen such patients running around completely immobilized on a full support device. <coughs> and we all know that there are excellent data out there on the Impella 5.0 in cardiogenic shock, for example. This is a meta-analysis and it shows excellent outcomes for the Impella 5.0 pump. And the possible indications for surgically implanted Impella device, cardiogenic shock, it's the safe weaning from ECMO devices. It's in many centers used as a bridge-to-bridge -bridge device to precondition patients before Elvert implantation. And before heart transplantation, I think it will gain more importance and I will talk about this topic a little bit more later when we talk about longer term support with an impeller device. We ho we've heard a lot about the impressive data from um, Berlin about myocarditis cases. And we will see a case uh, in a patient with Impella 5.5 for postcardiotomy failure later on. There are cases in which um, we see thrombus formation at the picta catheter and you see on the right side a thrombus that develop in the prosthesis of the Impella 5.0 device. And the majority of patients in our institution also have the you can call it propeller approach. They have longer term support than the approved 10 days in CEMA countries. And the uh, potential problems, uh, fortunately seen not often, you can depict from the picture over there. So the Impella 5.5 device was developed. It provides a flow up to 5.5 liters a minute, depending on the afterload, sometimes even higher of uh, 5.8 liters a minute. It's a design and has a CE mark approval for up to 30 days. The size is almost the same and I come to this in this slide. So the motor is a little bit shorter and the cannula is a little bit stiffer. It has an optical sensor of the device so we can measure or have an impression of the central aortic pressure and the afterload of the heart. This is a summary of the differences and you see on the picture on the right side, there is no pigtail on the Impella 5.5. It's a little bit shorter, it's a little bit stiffer, and therefore easier to implant. And we had the privilege to implant first in man the Impella 5.5 last year. Here you see the implant video of the first <coughs> implantation of the 5.5. It's very easy to implant and very easy to guide, as you can see. On this movie, um, the Impella device is not aligned perfectly um, to the apex, um, which is, from my point of view, very important. When we talk about longer term support, it's important that we avoid suction um, by proper placement of the inflow cannula, and by doing that, we um, might possibly avoid um, pump thrombosis in the uh, impeller device. There are implants, 32 implants in five German centers until April 2019. I don't want to go too much into detail. The results, early results, will be presented by Sebastian Schulte Eistrup at the ESCTS. But as far as I can tell you, very promising results for the first Impella 5.5 implantations. And an example of an Impella 5.5 patients, you already have seen patients from Berlin. This is a 63-year-old male patient has a status post aortic valve replacement with a biological valve, and this valve was deteriorated with a stenosis, and the ejection fraction before surgery was 26% with an end diastolic diameter of almost 70 millimeters. And usually we do a, a catheter-based valve and valve procedure in such patients. In this particular case, the anatomy of the coronaries was not favorable for a interventional valve and valve procedure, so we aim for a redo aortic valve replacement and we replace the biological valve by a pericardial perimont magna ease uh, valve and we were unable to wean this patient 
safely from cardiopulmonary bypass and decided uh, to implant Impella 5.5, which you can see on the chest X-ray. And um, with the yellow arrow, I marked the biological valve, and that worked very well. The patient was extubated soon after surgery, was fully mobilized on the per first post-operative day, and the um, device was explanted eight days um, under local anesthesia. And the, um, you see the echo on the right side um, before discharge, and the patient has an ejection fraction of 35% and, and diastolic diameter of 60 millimeters. There is a Impella Connect remote monitoring available now. We were the first, had the privilege being the first to use it in Europe. There are a few centers in the US who already use this technique. Um, the technique is that the controller is connected to a Wi-Fi and to a cloud. And you see a screenshot on the right-hand side from my iPhone, and that was the patient I showed you before in May after aortic valve replacement, and we can see all the data we have on the controller, on site, on the ICU, and you can be wherever you are, and um, the ICU, for example, can call you and you can discuss um, patient and, and settings, and by um, also monitoring the, the settings and estimating central aortic pressure by the central aortic measurement from the impeller device. So you have all the data, also alarms uh, that occurred in the past. You can look up uh, flow measures, and um, by doing that, we might also further improve outcomes in these patients. I want you to guide you another aspect when we talk about longer-term support with surgically implanted devices. There has been a change in uh, U.S. heart transplantation allocation policy in fall last year in the U.S., with a um, higher priority to patients on short-term devices, especially on VA ECMO. And there is a nice study from the UNOS database, we all know those data, also from the ISHUT, uh, which focuses on post-transplant outcomes after short-term device treatment. And this uh, study showed what we already knew from ISHUT registry data, that transplant outcome are poorest for patients on VA ECMO. In contrast to um, priorizing, and I understand that patients who are on a short-term device have the highest urgency, but in contrast to this, have also worst outcomes. And I had the privilege to comment this uh, manuscript by an editorial, and the attention is to do a good thing, but it could result in a Faustian bargain but uh, by having a dismal outcome, which was described by Wolfgang Goethe in Faust. But the solution could be to implant a full support device, like the impeller device, with a longer-term support. The patient can be mobilized, and by doing that, might have a better outcome. And this is currently reflected in the second status in the UNOS allocation policy. What's in the future? There is hopefully a BTR pump, bridge to recovery pump. The goal is to have a um, pump that is perchless, can be um, implanted for a long time, designed uh, to recover patients. The um, uh, approval um, is ideally longer than 30 days and patients can be on, on support one year, maybe longer and can be, the patient can be fully mobilized and discharged home. And there are many designs that are under investigation. I don't want to go too much into detail. And also from the approach aspect, there are many approaches where Abiumid is thinking of. It's axillary approach, it's transeptal approach, and it's transapical approach, and we will see what's in the future. What are the challenges? It's ingrowth of the catheter, still clot formation. It should be a safe and reliable exit port to the vessel and to the device, and the device itself should be easily explanted once the heart has recovered. I would like to summarize that with excellent outcomes already for the impeller device, it's approved for up to 10 days. The first results of the impeller 5.5 device are very promising, and the technical 
and design features, makes it very easy to implant the device, and this is also important for longer term support. And I think this 30 day approval is important. Often we don't know at the time of implantation how long the patient needs support. And we can be very curious what the future brings in terms of the BTR pump. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for this presentation. Other questions from the floor? What is your personal preference regarding uh, upper body access from the right or from the left side? Right side. Why? Um, I have no data on that, but um, as a cardiac surgeon, if you um, uh, do surgery for um, aortic dissections or arch surgery, there's so much calcification in there, and I, am, I feel not very confident to cross the um, aortic arch and have a catheter for a longer time lying through the aortic arch, but there are no data. Fortunately, the stroke rates are low, and we don't see many complications on that, so this is just, it's just, it's just a gut feeling, but um, I really like the right side, and often patients have the ICD CRT device in patients who have acute or chronic heart failure on the left-hand side. So I don't like the idea to prepare the axillary artery close to a CRT or ICD device, um, although we rarely see infections uh, from, the, from the implant side, but still I don't want to, to go on the side of the, of the ICD CRT device. That's a great presentation, I appreciate it. I think I speak for most of the American surgeons when I say can't wait to get my hands on the 5.5 five either. Um, it, it seems exciting. A couple of questions, just technical uh, questions. First of all, if you decide to insert this directly into the aorta, similar to the LD device, how much ascending aorta do you need? Normally, we're, with the LD, we're measuring seven centimeters from the annulus. Um, is the device short enough that you can get away with a shorter aorta and still uh, uh, to put it in that way? And then the second question is, from, from this, anecdotally, from the standpoint of uh, complications such as hemolysis, thrombocytopenia, coagulopathy, those things, do you notice any difference between the 5.5 five, uh, and the other, and the five liter devices that you've used in the past? Is, is there a significant difference in surgical related complications that you've noticed? Regarding the first question about Impella 5.5 five, five implantation direct aortic, or uh, using a prosthesis, um, from the best of my knowledge, it hasn't been done in this uh, five centers, so I haven't done it, um, but um, it's it may be possible, probably it is possible, it's shorter and it should be easier than the 5.0, I've done some 5.0 cases, direct aortic. Um, regarding the second question, um, there was not much hemo hemolysis seen in, in, in these first series, so it, it seems a very, very promising pump and um, um, really based on the, the idea to um, develop a uh, longer lasting pump, uh, it seems to work. And we don't see much hemolysis. And I think very important, as I said before, and, um, is proper placement. My personal experience is it sometimes looks in the AP uh, fluoroscopy, the pump looks fine um, after, after placement. But um, if you look in TE, you see that it's not properly placed and pointing to the apex. It's um, sometimes pointing to the septum or um, it's um, in some way affecting the subvalvular mitral apparatus. And by doing that, I think um, you might create um, hemolysis either directly or by um, um, creating suction alarms and by, cre by suction creating um, um, a thrombus um, in the in the in the inflow cannula. Again, thank you very much.